Well, hey, First Reform Church. Uh, at this time, I want to bring in uh, two uh, good friends of mine, uh, Ricky Sanchez, who a number of you know is uh, pastor of Solid Rock Ministries in Storm Lake, uh, with which First Reform Church has a close partnership. And then uh, my friend and neighbor, uh, Ron Franklin, who uh, works in uh, intercultural development at Northwestern College and uh, is um, a wise and gifted leader, too, that uh, over the years I've gotten to, to know and increasingly come to respect his, his perspective and his love for the Lord as well. And uh, I, I wanted to bring in these friends because they have uh, different backgrounds than most of us here at First Reformed Church do. And so they can, uh, they can help layer on wisdom and understanding for our congregation as we think about how to be faithful followers of Christ, how to be good practitioners of the first and second commandments together that Jesus gives as the greatest in all the law. And, and to, to learn and maybe to even have them deconstruct some of the things we were confident about and then rebuild some things that we were not clear about in the past. And so I've asked them to talk with me a little bit about this idea of biblical justice, which we're exploring uh, today. And so I'll start with you, Ron, um, as, as a theologian and someone who knows the scriptures well, what does your uh, theology of justice entail? Uh, what, is that, what does that mean? Maybe what doesn't it mean? And, and where do you see the church uh, can do a better job of living out what the authors of Scripture have called us unto? Yeah, first I would say uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Breen, Tim, um, yeah, for allowing this conversation to happen because I think it's necessary for us on a number of levels. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful uh, to serve in whatever capacity is, is best fit for, for us to facilitate uh, participation in God's redemptive work. Um, but yeah, as it relates to the question, this biblical narrative and, and my kind of walk away, take away from uh, what, I, what I've come to understand in terms of the, the trajectory or the thread that's running through scripture from Genesis to Revelation, I think justice is there throughout. Um, and, it, and it is there alongside uh, the beauty of the diversity of um, of people uh, in in God's creation, and so I think um, more specifically, as we think about what justice is, I guess in 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 my spirit, the thing that rings loudest is that justice is to make things right. Um, but the thing we have to be mindful of or cautious of is that. Uh, the compass that helps us understand what making things right uh, is directed toward has to be guided by something outside of ourselves because we are so beautifully broken. Um, and so then that calls my attention to, of course, an understanding of, of what is what is God up to in the world. Um, and, and that's about restoration and, and making things right uh, for all of creation uh, so that it's toward shalom and thriving. Um, and, and to the glory of God, right? So, and so um, as, <laughs> as I try to articulate what is, what is my theology of justice, it's about making things right, uh, putting things back into right relationship. And uh, we have laws, right, that attempt to help us govern and understand what justice looks like. Um, but I think we have to be persistent in reminding ourselves that our form of justice, our legal systems and et cetera, don't always align as well as they should with that of our creator. Um, and then just to exemplify that, right, we, we have the example of Jesus who gave everything to help us understand what that type of pathway towards God's justice looks like. And unfortunately, um, we didn't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear what that really looks like. And we killed that guy who was like the greatest <laughs> Um, guide for us towards what God had in store for us related to justice, about, related to making things right. Um, and then more specifically, I think we can see really clearly that God was on the side of the vulnerable, um, and he was quite scathing in his interactions with those who probably we would find ourselves most aligned with, is kind of the religious scholars and thinkers and kind of people who were committed to their faith. Man, um, that yeah, Jesus was was pretty pretty critical of, of folks like us, um, and and took a very different approach to, yeah, liberating the captives. Uh, that's, that's like the the first thing that he started to note when the scrolls were passed to him, and he said, "It's, it's happening right now." And then, in him, the law and the prophets have been fulfilled, right? And so that's when we get to this simplicity of 
difficulty of loving God and loving neighbor as ourselves, uh, all of the law is, is covered in, in that. So anyway, that's, those are the things that come to mind for me in terms of the thread throughout scripture about what, what justice means. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of what guides my orientation, but the difficulty is that I <laughs> have to be cautious and that my orientation stays in line with that of the creator. And that's, that's hard to do by oneself. Um, and it definitely goes beyond an intellectual exploration of, of my own uh, understanding of what God is up to in the world. That's, that's excellent. And I love the reference to, to Luke 4 there with Jesus. And, you know, people were tracking along with him pretty good. And then he says, today, this has been fulfilled you're hearing. And they try to push him off the cliff. So we have these systems that react against justice in some way that are just threaded into our world. And I really liked your word alignment there. And you and I shared a, a common friendship uh, with Dr. Mark Husbands, and he always talked about the four kinds of alignment that we have with God, with one another, with ourselves, and with our world. And that alignment ultimately kind of wells up into a vision for shalom and justice. So, Ricky, how, wh what would you like to say about your understanding of God's word and, and justice and uh, righteousness as, and alignment as Ron laid it out uh, from, from the Old and New Testaments? I think that we, we take pride in the word justice, you know, and we hear that over and over on our systems and what we created. But sometimes it's far from what really has been written uh, to the practice. And so I think that we've seen that enough. Things have now a way to show up more and more uh, in public uh, through video, through things that are recorded and things like that, where uh, we face a reality that, that justice is relative, uh, relative to where, you know, the different things and so some people they are since we're talking about culture as well some people that come to the united states and uh they had a different sense of justice uh from their country from the background for you know it, and so to them is 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 a little different uh we take pride here in the united states that you know our justice system is you know it's based from a moral compass in the bible and and uh it, you know but in, in reality there are injustices there as well and so I think that, you know, from theology, we see that sometimes Jesus was able to stand up and say, hey, this, you know, this is not right. And, and but sometimes he said, hey, it's OK. You know, we got to pay taxes. We got to do this. We got to do several things where he uh, also uh, wasn't, you know, always pushing towards, hey, let's stand up and do this. Uh, sometimes it was let's accept what God wants here in this moment. And I think that's the balance that is hard to, to achieve uh, when you have different systems in place. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes they cross one another and how you view that. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing. But theology, I think, uh, obviously, Jesus was really always behind those who were, you know, you know committing injustice against. So... That's really good, Ricky. And uh, I think both of you together there have, have just really just started to help us look under the hood in terms of what is a really a cornucopia of biblical text we could reference on justice. As Ron said, this is a 66 book long presentation and revelation to the people of God about how they're called to live. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your personal experience, what you, what you have felt or maybe what you've witnessed um, we all know the power of story to open our eyes to places we might otherwise have lock and key uh, away from. Ricky, in, in your own experience, on uh, your own journey um, of faith or, or into, into adulthood or even in ministry, where have you witnessed or personally experienced justice failing people like you, people that you know, people that you love? I think that uh, the expectations or assumptions also uh, play a big part on, on you know, these failures that sometimes we see. Uh, for the longest times, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced that, seen it, and uh, seen other people uh, and the injustices and things like that. Um, they happen, you know, and sometimes, you know, like in my case, I never paid much attention to it. I just went on uh, in a way. I just, you know, thought, okay, well, this is okay. Uh, and I'll move on. But a lot of people struggle with that. And, and I really had to take a backseat approach to this until recently to start realizing, you know what, this has been happening to me for a long time. And I didn't, I did not know that. Um, or at least I didn't put a lot of attention to it. 
uh, I just move on and, and keep going, uh, always taking that, that backseat approach. Um, but I think there's a lot of, of those things happening. And, and what I re when I refer to that, I refer, for example, um, I would be stopped, you know, uh, traffic or airport or, you know, and I never really thought, why? Why am I, you know, why am I, what does this happen to me? And so as I get older, I get more aware of what is going on that sometimes those injustices, um, you know, and I'm a little more vocal now too about, hey, why is this happening? You know, uh, I think that the, it's one of the things that is causing this nation to realize, hey, maybe we, we have not been fair entirely. And so, um, but, you know, I don't want, I never want it to sound like, you know, complaining or things like that. So I always took the backseat approach and, and not trying to make sense of it, trying to make sense and always go that way. But uh, in reality, as you look back in my experiences, uh, there has been some, some things that have been right. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. How about you, Ron? Either overt or subtle ways that you've experienced um, stereotyping, exclusion, some of these manifestations of injustice in your, in your own life or in the lives of those that you care about? Yeah, um, I'm trying to figure out maybe what's the, the best uh, entry point into the conversation. And there's three things that kind of come to mind. Um, one, just my community context and what was expected for a person like me um, in growing up in North Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and then as I transitioned to a space in Northwest Iowa and Storm Lake, actually, uh, the type of efforts that I was trying to make to um, yeah, be a part of a, a different type of narrative in terms of what was expected for me. Um, and, and how that's kind of transpired to who, who I am today and kind of the, the position and posture that I take towards uh, actually trying to build people's capacity to, to function better as it relates to difference um, so, so that the things that happen to me don't happen uh, continually to others. So um, I'll give you just a quick snapshot of my background. So my, my brother, um, yeah, he was the person that I followed around and wanted to do everything like. Um, and I think as a part of the environment that we, we were in, um, that of course led to, to some behaviors that were <laughs> um, actually quite becoming more trivial in these days, right, in terms of uh, the use of marijuana and those types of things. Um, but yeah, uh, in association with those types of activities, my, my brother was, was away in the system for a while uh, in the criminal justice system. That really broke my heart. Um, but it also started to raise some awareness for me in terms of how people thought I was supposed to function in this world in terms of a kind of a perpetual participant in criminal activity, mm -hmm. right? And so my awareness started to rise a little bit because, you know, it's part of my family now, whatever. Um, and I was always conscious. I had spent a lot of time in and out of spaces that uh, involved different community members. So um, in North Kansas City, there's people who live up in the hills, a uh, place that we call Briar Cliff. So a number of Chiefs players and, uh, you know, celebrities in our region kind of live in that space. And I had friends there. Um, and I went to school with people who were from a neighborhood like my own, which was a uh, pretty well impoverished kind of government housing and stuff. Um, and and uh, yeah, that exposed me to having bus rides in the morning with the poor kids and then uh, vehicle rides with the rich kids as I um, completed basketball practices and et cetera. But, uh, by the time I got to high school, I, I uh, had really long hair, um, and it was often braided. And um, there were some things coming to the surface, right, in terms of what it meant to be black in America. And at that point in time, one in three uh, were your chances of, of being uh, dead, arrested, or in jail by the time you were 30. And so um, that really became apparent to me as I decided to drive my friend's uh, little Mazda 6 around our community library, which was just a block away from our high school, and another block away was the police station. And so I took the liberty of driving a stick shift for the first time, uh, which I don't know how many of you are gifted enough to, to just uh, hop behind those types of vehicles and, uh, and do what you want with them. Uh, but I killed it in the parking lot a number of times, and so it looked like the vehicle was seizing up or something, right? Um, but I was pretty cautious, right? I made sure not to damage anybody else's property. Um, but the way it turned out, it was the opening ceremony of this library of ours in our community. And I went back inside to tell my friend Brandon, like, hey, 
I drove a car through the parking lot, man. I'm, I'm sorry about it. I killed it. I sucked. Um, and actually, yeah, everything's fine, though. Uh, but I go into the bathroom and try to refresh myself and get my, get my stuff together. And uh, an older gentleman, white gentleman, walks in, and then he turns around and walks back out. And I'm thinking to myself, this is really odd. Nobody goes to the bathroom and doesn't go to the bathroom. So uh, what is going on here, right? And the next people who come in is two police officers and they arrest me uh, in the bathroom and uh, walk me out of the library. Again, kind of grand opening, ribbon cutting ceremony. And um, at that time I had this massive head of hair. My braids were not in, uh, it, was, it was out. And so it, it, it looked like a classic case of cops, which was like everybody's favorite show about that time. Uh, in society. And so um, the thing that really hit me in that moment was like, wow, I'm, I'm doing the perp walk. Uh, and generally speaking, I, I had never been in trouble before that moment in time. Um, but to recognize that that was the mold that I was being folded into, um, that really shook me. Uh, and then what really, what really tipped me off was the treatment that I got once I was in the facility. So I had to take off my belt and take off my shoelaces um, all of these kind of precautionary things. And I was put in a, a holding cell for about six hours uh, as, a, as a sophomore in high school. And so, um, yeah, from that experience, um, I really realized the pain that it was having, uh, not only on myself and my friends and my community, but also on my parents. Uh, my, my dad hardly wanted to say a word to me and he's not one who was short on words. And uh, my mom was just uh, pretty broken up and in tears. Um, and so it was kind of at that moment that I kind of had this reawakening with, with my creator, because uh, all the other things that are in there is like a reader's digest and a Bible, uh, other than the bathroom and the bed. And so, um, yeah, it just, it just really uh, changed the trajectory of my life uh, in terms of being, being scared straight. Uh, but it wasn't so much the fear of the PD or anything of that sort. It was more about changing the tide uh, of, of that astounding statistic right for for black males in america that you'd be dead or in jail by the time you were 30 and so um from that uh i had a experience with a judge and um to kind of adjudicate my experience or what the wrong that i did right um and i was charged with multiple hits uh and run running in the parking lot is is what was brought forward in terms of my my case and uh, the hope, I think, from the judge was to send me to jail, but uh, someone like an angel kind of flew in and told someone to remind the judge that I was a minor. And so uh, I, was, I was not sent off. I was uh, given um, community service, ironically, at the library. And that's what turned me into an athletic nerd. So I love sports all throughout life, but uh, the time that I spent in the library really, really changed like my effort and energy towards becoming uh, a student of life, uh, and, and of people and, and how to do how to do life with other people well so yeah that's just a snapshot man but then yeah I, I decided to come out to northwest Iowa and, and go to school and that was all due to relationships so my basketball coach was Jim Heiner kind of legendary coach in northwest Iowa and his son Kirk Heiner was playing at Kansas at the time and so that's what led me connecting with um, a coach that Jim Heiner knew Brian Van Hafton a good old northwest Iowa boy uh, who's now coaching at Dort um, but yeah, through that relationship, I, I came here to play basketball and, um, yeah, I became a, a residence hall director and, uh, you know, long story short, there was a student in our dorm, uh, who was smoking marijuana in his room and I had to come in and, um, kind of hold him accountable for his behaviors and his actions. And, uh, I called the PD, I let them know where we were, called our campus security and we're all sitting in the room and I'm in a, a suit and tie at the time. And I'm sitting down kind of letting this student know like it's going to be all right. The system isn't that bad. They'll take good care of you. You can always bounce back from making mistakes. And uh, the police walk in the room and they ask me to stand up and put my hands behind my back. And so uh, those were just, I guess, some of the, yeah, I guess, uh, revealing experiences that I've had with, with police in particular, kind of given the context that we're reflecting on right now and some of the relationships with officers and perceptions and what's kind of protected for your life. Uh, based on the color of your skin and such. But yeah, at the same time, I, I still remain uh, seated in this place of hope and redemption and restoration that's promised to us through a uh, good God who gave us a, a good gospel and a good son to follow. So um, nonetheless, man, the hope is there. But yeah, those are just some of the experiences that I, that I encounter. And then it even gets 
humorous from time to time. I went to vote the other night, and for whatever reason, as I'm leaving the voting space, uh, someone said to me, oh, they let you do that? And I have no idea what that was about, if it was supposed to be for some level of humor or, you know, to, to warm my spirits in whatever way. I have no clue. Didn't know the person. Um, but, yeah, those are the things that, I mean, uh, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim maybe a daily basis, like daily type experience, but those are the things that, that call into question for me, you know, every day, who I am and what I'm purposed here to do. Um, but I, but I stay, I stay rooted in the, in the faith, man, that, that God has put me here. It's kind of a mission field that's backwards for me. Typically people move from rural environments to urban. And for me, I was gone from urban to, to rural because I think God has called me here to do some work and to be a part of his redemptive work in that space. And, and I, can, I can certainly affirm that. Uh, I've learned a lot from you already. And it just, I don't know, it makes my blood boil. There are even people joke about those kind of things uh, that what, what's behind the joke. And so I, I just honor and respect both of you for being able to, to stay, as you said, rooted, uh, Ron and, and, and Ricky, to be able to kind of keep, keep your, your own uh, blood pressure down and be able to take some of these things uh, with patience and the fruit of the spirit is amazing because I hear them and I get agitated for you uh, because you're my friends. Um, okay, Ron, missionary to those of us here in Orange City, uh, let's kind of wrap it up with, with a little bit of application here uh, for our members. And then Ricky, I'll kind of give you the last word on this. But um, most of us are white, we're of Anglo descent, a whole bunch of us are of Northern European Dutch descent. Um, but uh, we're all one in Christ and we want to be part of the work of anti-racism. We want to, to name what's wrong and to, to not keep problems that we, we might, because of our privilege, have the luxury of keeping at arm's length. We want to step into this and, and be active participants in the redemption of the world with you. So what are maybe one or two things that we can pick up and carry and do um, uh, as part of this movement for change that has been kind of brought right into the front of our, of our screen over the last two weeks? Yeah, I, <laughs> this, is a, this could be a long answer, but I'll keep it short. There's two things that I have in mind. One is uh, staying faithful and prayerful uh, and committed to doing the work that it takes to continue to have our eyes open and our ears uh, cleaned out to, to hear and see what God has intended for us to understand what it looks like to love God and love neighbor as ourselves. Um, that, that, that work is as internal as it is external and communal. It has to happen together. Um, and then uh, maybe more specifically in terms of what that work can look like, um, the material that I've become, I don't know if you say a fan of, uh, but I'm, I'm all about skill development, capacity building, um, both at an individual, individual and uh, kind of communal level. And the thing that I've come across that's been most effective, at least in helping us conceptualize what it looks like to get better, um, is what we call cultural intelligence. And so you can check out culturalp.com. Uh, this is primarily rooted out of a, a business and educational space, um, but the president and the researchers, the, the ones that are leading the organization, the Cultural Intelligence Center, uh, which is based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, they, they are believers. And um, what that material is about is, is helping build the capacity or the, the ability to function effectively in spaces that are characterized by cultural difference. And so there's four things that folks who are most effective um, have as a capacity. Uh, they have high levels of CQ drive, which is like your level of interest and persistence in functioning in spaces where difference is prevalent. Uh, then you have CQ knowledge, which is I think often where uh, the reformed faith excels. Uh, so this is understanding how and why cultures are different and why they think the way that they think and et cetera. Um, so this could be business values, cultural norms and et cetera. Um, but then beyond the knowledge piece, uh, it's also some strategy, right? So we need to be wise and mindful about how we're going to enter into some space with some people who are different than us. Often we think, right, our traditional leadership practices are going to be transferable to any space that we enter into. Uh, but leadership looks different for different people at different times and in different places. So we need to be mindful of that. And then lastly is CQ action. And so that's the, the tone and tenor in which you talk or if you're direct or indirect in your communication style. 
Um, and so I'll just give you a funny example of, of uh, DQ action. In my, in, in my upbringing, uh, because of the need to get your, get your stuff in line, and if, let's say, for example, you come into an encounter with a authority figure, right, we, we speak directly. It's yes, sir, no, sir. Um, in, in the way that I was brought up and my dad's a, a former Marine. So um, that's the way we were taught to speak. And then I land in this space in Northwest Iowa and um, it comes time for dinner and you ask uh, someone if they want milk or water to drink and they say, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> I do not know how to interpret what just happened there. And so I had to do some learning in terms of how I actually show up and communicate in those spaces. And that's what the feedback is about. Um, it's about your verbal, nonverbal, um, and sociolinguistic kind of communication patterns. So, yeah, that's that's something that you can do. You can stay committed, understanding right the link of justice throughout uh, this this good book that we've committed ourselves to, and this good guy that we follow. Um, and then you can also work on developing your capacity to function effectively among the difference. And that's that's what this is all about. That's that's excellent. You know, like the context matters so much, and uh, learning that agility is is wonderful. Uh, Brother Enrique, uh, what else can can you add to what Ron said that we you you know some of the folks at First Reform Church and you know their hearts. What what what's next for us to learn in this process of growing in our agility? I, I think I, I think I just want to appreciate what Ron's words. They were really good and, and exactly where where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm I know God is trying to do a work here. Mm -hmm. And um, dignity and understanding is the biggest thing. And, uh, and I think he put it in a better words with uh, the awareness of the culture. Um, not too long ago, I had a couple, earlier couple here in our house. And uh, my wife and I were looking at each other because some of the comments uh, that they were saying, they were saying in the love of Christ, but yet some things just came right through the surface. And so we didn't know if there were, uh, there were a little bit of uh, racial comments. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, I love these guys, but uh, they're, you know, they don't know, they don't, they don't have that awareness, they don't have that, uh, in this case, I would say understanding uh, of how to dignify, you know, another person, even if they don't understand how the culture and, and everything else functions. And so from our perspective and where we're at right now, uh, there is, uh, I, I would say there's division and, and, and the media is creating more division and, and, you know, the United States is, is really struggling right now with this division. Uh, many of that that we face here is from Western to, uh, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere uh, on how things function. I, I'm an observer. I'm a learner. I love to learn that. And I'm doing that. I'm learning little by little how things function with all the cultures here. But um, that being said, I think that if we have dignity, we will learn as a church we will learn or want to learn how the other people are, you know, the, who you're dealing with, you know, how, do I know enough? Uh, very seldom somebody asks me questions about my bringing, my upbringing in, in Mexico, my, you know, growing up in Mexico. Uh, it's more about here. Well, exactly what the number one point Ron said, you know, is about adaptability. So mm -hmm. I was very flexible in, in my ways of adapting and adjusting and alignment. Uh, to what's going on, but uh, in the sense, you know, there's a reason. Uh, I always say, hey, people think that, you know, in Mexico, for example, people take a siesta, right? Well, they don't know why. It's because it's so hot, you can hardly function mm -hmm. in the middle of the day, and then you work later. So it's not about not being able to work or, or being lazy. It's about being smart about when you work and you can be more efficient. So mm -hmm. it's, all about, it's all about learning and adaptability. But I think that uh, here in, in Storm Lake and as the church around us are trying to figure out how we do this. Um, this is something that's been going on for a year and a half in my mind, trying to figure out how can we be effective? How can we be efficient and really get to know the ways of people, their culture? You know, nobody wants to lose their heritage. Nobody wants to lose how they, you know, but yet they got to function in, in the United States. And so that kind of question comes about from the love of Christ, from our perspective of loving people, you know, maybe we want them to be like us instead of us learning their, uh, you know, with dignity and understanding what it is that they are about. And so that is a passion for me right now as I'm learning culture, as I'm learning languages, uh, because I can see how even if I fail in my language learning, 
uh, they appreciate that I'm trying, that I'm trying to learn how they eat. I eat their food. And not only that, I know now some of their names and things like that for the food, I, I mean. And so that in itself shows that I'm trying to treat them with dignity. And I think that's where we miss sometimes uh, in church is not that, not that it's been treated with, you know, undignity, but just to understand where they're coming from. Uh, and then this other person Christ loves so much that uh, that we should learn some things about them. That's, that's really good stuff, Ricky. Thank you. I'm always willing to help with learning by way of eating new foods, too. It's just you got my number. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess for ra wrapping up, I, I think at this point in my, my life, to what you both said, I feel a little bit like the man in Mark 8. You know, Jesus kind of spits in the, in the man can see a little bit. Jesus says, what do you see? And the guy says, I see people, but they look like trees. Um, he did, he had, he, his vision was growing, but it was not fully formed. And I know where that, that's definitely true of me that I'm, I'm learning in ways that I didn't understand five years ago, five months ago, but I know that I need more friends like you in my life and many others to help me to continue to see clearly what I have planks in my eyes and can't see right now. Ron Franklin, Ricky Sanchez, thank you so much for your time and for your teaching for us. And uh, we continue to pray for you and the work you do for your, for your wives, your, your kids, and uh, that uh, God would be glorified in everything you say and do. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Tim. Peace. And that's where I'll end it. Hey, great. Well, okay, so my expectations were here, and you guys blew them through the roof. <laughs> so thank you thank you so much i'm not one for empty flattery but that was absolutely wonderful um good tools good theology um and i can't wait to share that with our congregation yeah, do, do you mind man let us let us know like how how things land because i i think i'm i'm always in the in the mode and mood for for learning how how these types of messages are being received, man. Like these are for me, those are my brothers and sisters who are gonna hear this conversation right now. I wanna know how how it's landing for them. Like, is it something that they feel like they want more of? Is it something that they wanna push back on? Is it, does it feel like it's too egalitarian or, e I don't know, you know, um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm just, I'm interested to, to hear how, how the people are receiving and, and where their spirits are. Like what, you know what I mean? How do we, how do we care for them? Uh, Cause it's a, it's a journey, man. It's not a, <laughs> it's, it's not a final destination. Um, and that's yeah, it's not, it's not binary. It's kind of not figured out or have nothing figured right. out. We're all in that spectrum. And, right. uh, I have a high degree of confidence that um, the people in our church have, uh, I think it's partly been shaped by working with Ricky and, and, the, and the, as you know, the tapestry of cultures in Storm Lake that um, we're beginning to see just how narrow of a slice of pie North American Reformed Presbyterian Christianity is within mm. this, this global movement of redemption that God's about and mm. um, it, that we, we have a voice in it, but we have just uh, far, far more to learn than we have to say. Um, and so, Ricky, I don't know if you knew this, but Ron, Ron has been spearheading uh, a special uh, walk for justice that will be taking place tomorrow in Orange City. Um, I'm really looking forward to being a part of that, taking my kids out there to learn a little bit more. Uh, it's amazing, Ron, how curious Jericho is about the stuff with George Floyd. And mm -hmm. like, his heart is really tender. I mean, one of his best friends is, is uh, Haitian, uh, Al Baravinzi of Tim and Sarah um, And uh, so he, his, one of his best buddies is black. He can't figure out why all this stuff's going down. So mm. I, I, as 11 years old, I'm trying to teach him. So it'll be, it'll be cool to be at that too. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be a special day for our community tomorrow. Yeah. Tim, I, I got to say, uh, if, you, if you convey this message to First Reformed Church, I've, in 27 years of ministry, I've never seen a church or a group of people like the ones from Orange City that are passionate, that they want, they, they have that love of Christ, they want to share in whatever each way. Um, they can, and I, and I, I, I can never say enough to, to say I've never experienced that in 27 years of people mm -hmm. interested so much in what's going on here and, and with us and praying for us. So uh, it's a big, big uh, thank you and, and for the support and, and, you know, obviously your spirit here and that with, with them, but uh, we feel the love and that's, that's the important thing. It's great. It's, I love being pastor of this church and the, I think, what makes Orange City and maybe Sioux Center a little bit different from 
typical Northwest Iowa community. We have the colleges here, and so we do get sort of a, a, a tributaries of, of new ways of looking at the world, and so we're not so insular as we might be based purely on our geography. And so people are genuinely curious. They, they're willing to think in new categories. And um, if, I mean, this just sounds so Pauline, but if at base they know we have the same Jesus and we are working for what Jesus died mm. to redeem the world of, mm. it, they really, they have an incredible capacity to go to, to new ways of thinking and new ways of life. So um, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to be, to be a pastor in this town and this church. Mm -hmm. So 